to the Mike Huckabee Show. Colonel Lee Ellis is retired from the United States Air Force for five years. He was a POW in Vietnam, along with Senator John McCain. He's now president and founder of Leadership Freedom, LLC. It's a company that uh, deals with leadership and team development. He's also the author of the book, Leading with Honor, Leadership Lessons from the Hanoi Hilton. And he's here to talk about leadership and accountability, things that, unfortunately, we don't hear a whole lot about anymore. Colonel, an honor to have you with me today. Governor Huckabee, it's great to be with you. I had a chance to meet you, uh, I think, in January when I was in your building there and what New York City, and that was a great privilege, and I often think of that. Well, the privilege was mine, and, uh, you know, I, I hap happen to believe you must have also been uh, a POW during the time when uh, Bud Day was uh, there. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. In fact, uh, I flew combat missions alongside Bud before he was shot down in August of 1967. Uh, if you know him, you know he's got a real gravelly voice. Well, he actually had it before he was shot down and captured, and he was probably one of the most courageous uh, pilots I'd ever flown with uh, in the, you know, doing operations with in combat. And then uh, I went, went down in November of 1967 and joined him up in Hanoi Hilton and got to know him there. And what a tough guy, what a great leader and he was. And we sure miss him already, but we know he's gone to a good place. Well, you know, Bud Day was one of those people who is legendary, and mm -hmm. uh, he lived not far from where I live now, down on the Gulf Coast. And, uh, you know, I was just so impressed and grateful, frankly, for the extraordinary send-off uh, that the community all along the Emerald Coast of Florida gave to uh, this incredible American Bud Day. Um, yeah. You know, there's just not enough to say about a person who experienced what he did, and then when he got home, uh, continued to fight for veterans every day of his life, and, and just a remarkable human being, as are you. And, and that's why I'm so delighted to be able to visit with you. One of the things you, you talk about in your book is that uh, we really lack a sense of leadership, uh, seeing it as a sacred trust. Mm -hmm. Let, let's talk about what you mean by that. Well, leaders have responsibility for either creating the vision or carrying out the vision. And just as important, they have responsibility for the people who are entrusted to them to carry out that mission and vision. So it, to me, it's a very sacred responsibility. In the military, of course, it's sacred because you're entrusted with the lives, the life and death of your people who work for you that you're leading there. Uh, we certainly saw that in the POW camps with our leaders. They understood that. But every day people go to work, they have hopes, dreams, aspirations, they have talents that needed to be developed further, and they're hoping and looking for someone to lead them who knows where they're going and has purpose and meaning and values and then provides the leadership and the development for them all, for the whole entire team, to go forward and achieve that mission. So you're responsible for people's lives. To me, that makes it a sacred trust. You spent five years in a POW camp in Vietnam, and, I mean, everybody who has read anything from any of the people there know that it was a horrible situation, uh, torture and deprivation and every attempt to try to uh, get you to break and uh, renounce your country and your freedom. You, le you learned things there, probably, that there's no school could have ever taught you. As you look back on that experience, what were the key lessons that you learned in the deprivation of your freedom that taught you more about freedom as you came out and then uh, began to teach about it? I think the most important thing that I learned there was to know what you're committed for or what, you're committed, what your commitments are, let's put it that way, your values, your mission, your vision, and those kinds of things, and then have the courage to live them out day to day. In our case, uh, our leaders were the ones that always went first into the fire, and they were burned, so to speak. I'm using that, uh, you know, loosely there, but they were beaten. They were beaten. They were tortured, and yet they bounced back time and again to stand up and just go do the right thing. You know, they were not at the back of the line uh, telling others what to do. They were at the front of the line saying, here's what we should do, and then they had to go first and suffer the consequences of good leadership. So I think doing, being conscientious to do the right thing is so critical, it needs to be foremost in our mind, not only as leaders, but as followers also. So 
So I think that was number one. Have the courage, have the character to do what you know is right. And we generally know what's right. You know, we have values we've been taught at church and school. We have laws. We have professional ethics. In our case, we had the code of conduct. So we know what's right, the right thing to do. It's just hard. And so when it's hard, though, it doesn't mean that we get a, we get a free pass. We still have to go do it. And I think that's the most important thing. Now, there are many other things other than uh, guarding your character, confronting your doubts and fears. I think knowing yourself is one of the very important ones. You can't be authentic unless you really know yourself. You believe in yourself. You know yourself in a balanced way in that you know where you're strong, but you also know where you're weak, and you're willing to work on that and to deal with that. So there was those were some of the key personal lessons, and then I also tried to look at what does it mean to lead others, and there you've got to clarify the culture. You've got to over-communicate the message. You've got to develop your people. You've got to balance mission and people, and that's not easy. So there's just so many things that we could learn in that situation, and that's why uh, I focus those in my writing and speaking. You know, when you mentioned about leadership and that it's that quality that goes in first, I, I thought about a statement that I've often made and uh, speaking on leadership, and it's that real leaders don't get behind people, kick them in the rear, and tell them what to do. It's people who get in front and uh, model the behavior that needs to be done and says, follow me. And I, I, that's exactly what you have, have described as, as what real right. leadership is about. Yes. And, uh, go ahead. Well, I was just going to you know, ask that one of the things we don't have a lot of, Colonel, is accountability. You know, where people accept responsibility for what they've done, and then they accept the consequences if the behavior is uh, abnormal or offensive. And I'm thinking about, for example, you've got a mayor in San Diego who has clearly violated every bit of sacred trust that has been given to him in, in that position by abusing women and, uh -huh. and being just a, a creep. Right. And then you've got in New York a guy that wants to be mayor who has acted in ways that normally would be reserved for 13-year-old boys, not grown married men who want a position of authority. Right. Have we lost a sense of not only shame, but a sense also of, of holding people accountable for actions that are outrageous? Governor, you're, you're right on target with that. It's one of the major issues that I see as a leadership consultant, and it's very widespread from top to bottom, is having uh, a sense of what does it mean to clarify what's expected and then hold people accountable. And then the two cases that you mentioned, the political cases, it's the American people, the electorate, not holding leaders accountable and giving them a pass on behaviors that are just completely substandard. Uh, the two issues, they, they kind of go together, the courage issue and the responsibility and accountability type issue they go together, I think, in a, in a big way because people don't have the courage to hold them accountable, but also people don't have the courage to do the right thing when they're faced with it and to own up to it once they have made a mistake. But doesn't this go also to the fact that we're just reluctant to say certain things are immoral? I mean, it's almost like it's so unfashionable to use the term immorality, and therefore we, uh, we end up sort of getting what we deserve because... We never want to say something is wrong. We just want to say that person uh, has a different point of view, and we ought to be more tolerant. Yeah, you hit the word right on the head there. It's tolerance. You know, tolerance is a wonderful thing, and we do need, we needed tolerance in certain areas of our society and culture that we've had to grow in because we had some areas where we weren't tolerant appropriately. There wasn't justice and fairness, and we still need to work on some of those. But that doesn't mean that we need to be tolerant of dumb stuff like, the two examples you just gave and many others that we can think of, why should we tolerate that? We should call it out for what it is, and, and there should be some shame attached to it. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's very depressing to me that uh, we, we want to tolerate the behaviors that are destructive, uh -huh. that are behaviors that are selfish, uh, but when one talks about things like virtue, uh -huh. it's almost laughable, I mean, that, that people would still believe that character qualities like honor, virtue, fidelity are valuable. You had to, to really learn something about fidelity, faithfulness to your country, faithfulness to your vows, to your uh, own uh, fellow soldiers and sailors and airmen and marines when you were in captivity. What could the rest of us learn about just maintaining one's honor? 
I think it's so important to guard your character. We all assume we have good character. We all assume we have fidelity. Uh, but we really are all one step away from being pretty bad characters, to be honest with you. And so unless we are alert and constantly guarding ourselves and reviewing our commitments, then we're much more likely to step over the line and do something uh, that we might regret later or that we might regard, regard as infidelity. Uh, I think making those commitments and making them, um, you know, it's like people stand up in marriage and they make their vows, they make those commitments to to God and to all those in, in attendance, and the, there's a good reason why those commitments are made as vows in front of other people because it makes it more likely that they're going to keep them because they're formalized. I think as a person, you need to review your commitments, your values, those kind of things periodically, and then say, okay, now, do I have the courage to stand up for those uh, when I face uh, a situation where it's going to cost me something? In the POW case, uh, it cost us quite a bit to be loyal and have fidelity to our teammates and our country. It cost us uh, regularly. Uh, and they were always telling us, you know, you shouldn't be so stiff-necked and stubborn and, you know, you die-hard capitalist you and all this kind of stuff, which we, by the way, took as a, a real mark of pride to be called a die-hard capitalist. That was a good thing in our situation. But uh, the thing, I guess, that I really learned is that I actually grew in courage. I mean, I was a pretty courageous guy. I played sports and, you know, was rough and tumble kind of guy pretty aggressive guy about a lot of things, but when you're one-on-one -on -one with the enemy and the enemy has all the power and you have none except your will, uh, it can be pretty scary, and all of us were scared. But in spite of the fact that we had doubts and fears, we learned to, right in the breach of the, of the combat, you might say, to just stand firm and do what we knew was right and defend our country, and that I grew in the in my character, I grew that capability to do that stronger and stronger and stronger. And that occurred because I had leaders who were stronger in that area than I was, and they were my models, going back to what you said a minute ago. My guest is uh, Colonel Lee Ellis, author of the book, Leading with Honor, Leadership Lessons from the Hanoi Hilton. He spent five years in captivity. Uh, Colonel, so many people today say that a person's public life is separate from one's private life, and the two shouldn't be ever compared, and that what a person does in private is irrelevant to a person's uh, public service or, or public career. Do you agree with that? Absolutely not. I don't agree with that. I think it's very relative because we want to be authentic. We need authentic leaders. Those are the ones that we trust, the ones that are the same on the outside as they are on the inside. And when you have a private life that you're hiding, uh, that's a problem. And sooner or later it's going to come out, and then when it does come out, you're going to be afraid, and you're going to defend your, deny it, and then you're going to defend yourself, as we've seen so many people do, and you're going to cover it up. So that's why being authentic, you know, when you always tell the truth, then you don't ever have to worry about, you know, remembering what you said. You just tell the truth. And that's why I think it's so important. Secrets and secret lives are about the worst thing that we can get into, and I, as a person, you know, I'm, I have three other men that I meet regularly with, and we share some pretty deep secrets because we realize the power that secrets have over you. And having a private life on the side, you know, can, you know that's kind of the worst of infidelity in many ways. So we, are, we have to guard against that, and I just I don't buy the idea that uh, your private life is your private life. Now, I don't want people coming into my private life and putting it on the front page of the headlines. But my private life, uh, you know, my wife and my three guy friends, they know my private life very intimately. Well, Colonel, I want to say thanks for being here today and for the wonderful lessons of leadership that you've, uh, that you've given us. Uh, but most of all, I want to say thank you for your service to this country and for the fact that it's people like you that keep people like me free. And I, I trust and pray that none of us ever forget that. Uh, God bless you, and, and thanks for joining me today. Governor Huckabee, it's been a pleasure. I enjoy your programs on television, and I listen quite often on radio and WDUN in Gainesville, Georgia. So thank you for what you're doing. Well, it's, a, again, a real privilege to visit with you. Colonel Lee Ellis, again, his book is uh, Leading with Honor, Leadership Lessons from the Hanoi Hilton. His website, leeellis.us, and I hope you'll uh, find out more about this great American hero.